<clears throat> cool. So it's 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 seven a.m. Uh, Hank turned on the recording. It's Thursday, November fifth, twenty twenty. It is two days after election day in the U.S. Um, we had the workshop just last Thursday. Um, it is it is important that we go back and curate that and uh, and sort of you know go into it and figure out what we have and what it's going to turn us into. But 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 wait, there was an election just two days ago. In fact, this thing appears to be to still be in process. Uh, and, election. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, then, but, um, before you leave the curation piece, though, or the digestion piece, yes. um, I would love to help with consolidating, creating diagrams, flowing, um, because that's part of what I just love to do. <laughs> Um, why don't, so why don't I set up a call for, uh, let me just ask first, uh, tomorrow at eight or 9 AM, is that a convenient time for, for us to just sort of start meeting for things like that? Okay. Why don't I set up a, a zoom for 8 AM, uh, to start East coast, West coast, which time? Uh, sorry, 8 AM Pacific. Hey, Charles. Hi, um, just, just to quickly say, I'm not around probably because my kids are coming for the weekend tomorrow, but in general, I'm in for this stuff. And you've put in probably more effort than any of us in, in digesting and transmuting and improving uh, the work product. So, so oh, thank you. We hope so. And, and uh, Jerry, and Jerry, I, I um, also, you know, think that we, we should talk a little bit on this call about, a, you know, kind of a possible kind of set of buckets or set of frameworks that maybe instead of we have to do some processing of the whole, but I think that there may be ways of processing component pieces that emerged out of the conversations. And maybe we can test a little bit of what those pieces are with this, you know, with this group, because I think everybody's been thinking about that as well. Um, and that may give us a, the ability to divide and conquer a little bit. I think that's, that's awesome. a perfect suggestion, but I'd like to add a dimension to it. I should say, and I'd like to add a dimension to it. And that is, it might be more helpful given the complexity of processes, if we started with processes rather than buckets, just from the standpoint that I think it would help our organization have that sense of connection and, and be a little simpler than the sort of endless groups of categories of topics. So, can you give me, uh, can you help me understand um, the distinction that you're making between buckets and processes. Can, can I just offer that, that I, I hear process as communication and I think fundamentally we just sort of agree on what are the channels to talk about it. Like I guess discourse, what, there was a kind of consensus about using discourse for this, just whatever follow up so that there's continuity in the conversation. For me, that would be the fundamental process. Oh. And Judy, that's what you were referring to? Yes, I, I'm also wondering though, because there's a, there's sort of like, take a category, make a bunch of, identify the things you need to accomplish, build the steps to the, the, those outcomes. But, but from a process standpoint, do you, do you start at the end and the feed streams to it? Or do you start at the category heading and the derivatives of it? And I'm not, I don't know how to verbalize this very well, but it's the flow part in terms of the movement of energy that I'd like to see some way to capture if possible. I think Mark Antoine so, has something to add to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit, um, I think I, I understand we all want to direct and um, digest and make diagrams, but I feel that the groups we're still trying to digest their own experience. I mean, we all had reporting from the groups and uh, I know in our group, we are having a lot of processing of what happened and further asynchronous thinking. And we do need to each digest as a group and report to the larger group from uh, the smaller groups again, because we have further thoughts from the first exchange between the groups. And I think this needs to be reported. And uh, I think we need a meeting just for that before we know what, we're, what the buckets could be, <laughs> what, however we classify buckets. Um, so this could be an optional exercise for each of the teams to reconstitute themselves and just hold a call at their convenience soon 
to do to a process what they were working on and, and see whether whether they want to report it back to the whole the whole meeting <clears throat> and, and if so how but b um, to also do a little sensing from what they heard the other groups doing and move toward that a little bit and, and see if they can do some integrative work from their own perspective as part of their report back in. I think that would be really helpful. Uh, and Judy, I, th I think part of what you're looking for is, is process on, on this thing that we're talking about, which is how do, we, how do we take what we learned on Thursday? But I think also part of what you're trying to figure out is process first on how do we move forward to organize ourselves into buckets, for example, like, like buckets is a, is a great cause but how do we how do we decide buckets like and 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 how does that turn into teams and work and 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 how does that turn into milestones and reporting back is that right yes uh and there's a dimension of process that's culture what is the way that we accomplish things how do we agree as a collective to move to flow in various directions how do we allow the flows to split and how do that kind of thing and so uh, far it's more or less like a slime mold yeah. go ahead matt <laughs> i don't know if i like that analogy but well, it's a, which which is actually a good analogy but still go ahead there's a there's a there's a choice point here um you know we did one kind of one cycle of work and if you could if you think about it we did maybe two cycles of work where we individually did some work and then we started to share it and then we started to, you know, to process it. And I think, Mark, what you're saying is that, so one choice is that within the teams, we need to do a second iteration or a third iteration, right? And that's, and that, and that iteration is at, is in a whole, is like the holistic OGM system, right? The other way to attack this is like if we were doing a multi-day design shop, the second piece that we would probably do here is we might say, it's like a Rubik's cube. You design the whole, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna design a cut this way. And we're gonna break up into teams and do parallel cuts of different kind of different strata. And then you might rotate it and then do another round where you design the cut this way, right? And then you take it and then you design the whole again. So, you know, the question that I have right now is one choice point could be we stay within the same kind of groups and we do an iteration at the whole. The other is we stay, we get into new groups and we do an iteration of the whole. The third option is we um, get into new groups and we do a cut of some of the pieces, some of the elements that we know are important. Right, that emerged out of that first iteration. And that's when I said the word buckets, I'm not talking about perpetual teams and all that stuff. I'm just talking about it's, it's a slice of the whole so that we can get a little bit more detailed about that slice and then we can put them back, you know, we can see them and put them back together. So I think, I think this is the, a little bit of a choice point. And I know I'm also recognizing that Thursday's call have people on here that are, were in a part of the workshop that, um, but have, you know, contributed, you know, really valuable ideas, whether through discourse or through these calls, you know, to this, to this question as well. So I want to honor, you know, I kind of want to honor that as well. So that's the process question, you know, Judy, if that's I what like, you I like what you're asking. Also, because I think the more that we mix things up into different ways of examining them, the more richness there will be in the ultimate resolution. So I think that's a, a great suggestion, Matt. Laura and then Charles. Oh, I was just wondering if uh, we could offer anything. Um, we have a lot of minutes on Otter. Um, it, I don't want to step on uh, Pete's toes here if Pete's already doing the translation, <laughs> but we could throw it in there and it could do the translation. Uh, and I would love to go through the materials if they're available someplace. I couldn't be there because I was moving, um, but I would love to help process the information and to uh, listen to what went on. And Hank and I, I just, haven't gathered all the recordings yet in one place. Uh, go ahead, Charles. Just to offer a variation on Matt, what um, the, the kind of options you were laying out, which is maybe a combination of staying in the same groups um, for another iteration and then then mixing it up. 
Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. And I think this is the wonderful thing about OGM is, um, you know, it's a bunch of, in some ways, facilitators facilitating facilitators. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, for, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. And I don't have any des desire or need to control all of this. I'm sure you guys feel the same way. And yet we all have, you know, um, heuristics and processes and other things that we want to bring. So um, this is, I think, part of our culture defining, you know, Judy, right? Well, it is. I, I'm, I'm on the side of continual mixing because I think that you add richness because you'll put a bunch of people together who are working toward the same whole but had a different particular vision from their group and we will get that blending of those to a, a more holistic view. And then if you do it again with another mix, you're starting to really refine the, the picture of the space and the possible topics and flows. That's, that's my bias. And the reason is because we all love falling in love with our own models. And, you know, if you, if you, if you hold groups too closely together, what happens is you sort of fall in love with the model and then we debate those models versus if you keep that, you know, keep that mix, then, you know, then you, you don't, the ground isn't settled. Right. So I, I would just offer that I, I love all this and there's some good stuff in the chat there as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm just with trying to strike a balance that's, that's, uh, that's good, that's, that works and that um, doesn't sacrifice like the coherence or continuity of what's being kind of emerged in the initial iteration and phase. Like an, an interesting um, analogy in our case, in our group, um, we were playing with this uh, wholeness egg the egg uh, model and metaphor could be like, we need to form the, a thicker shell, a little more of a pr protective shell before we, you know, I don't know. So just whatever works, but, but as long as um, we don't lose some coherence in, in uh, the first phase. Yeah, maybe it's, a both, maybe it's a both and. We give people a choice, right? Um, Other thoughts on this? Somebody was just speaking up, sorry. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Harry, go uh, ahead. Hi. So maybe we could identify the models which came out of the first round of discussion. And then, um, because I remember there was uh, something with lots of circles in it, which looked very interesting. And uh, I remember in our group, we had some interesting looking arrows and uh, you know communities of knowers. And we could then, uh, give people the freedom to explore any model which they found interesting. And we could then allow for continuity plus, uh, you know, like uh, re, re looking or new looking at those models. And we could have maybe one placeholder from each team uh, sitting uh, with the model to do the show and tell and uh, refine the model through group discussion. Uh, maybe that's maybe we could even go through several of the models if we had time. Uh, just a thought. And we could judge them like a science fair project. Poster sessions. I'm, I'm hoping that what we're in is a generative stage where we're not judging and choosing between A, B, C, D, because the world is really big. And the more that we explore the multiple dimensions, I think the more coherent our overall end vision will be. A very OGME statement. <laughs> and also there's a bunch of people in the room here and on the list who weren't able to be in the workshop. So in, in a sense, we have to brief uh, everybody else on the, the best of what we think we, we, we got through. Uh, to kind of catch up and, and synchronize together, which is partly why I was saying that if the teams can reflect a little bit on what they heard from the whole and then bring that back to this whole, um, I think that'll, that'll step us forward a bit. Um, Lauren. I, I just kind of got stuck on that. Um, that's a very OGME kind of statement. And I'd actually, I think we could explore that and um, what was what was it about that statement that was OGME? And what what out of all the things we, we've said here, what are the most OGME kind of things that fascinates me? What I mean, 
what are can we decide what what are OGM kind of things to say? <laughs> well, and, and I think Lauren, what you're drawing our attention to is the the birth of culture uh, for a group, any group that's organizing itself to try to achieve something. And and I think when we say that something is OGM or that something is googly or that something is you know name your name your older organization with an actual strong culture. What you're calling out is what's unique about the culture and what what sort of matters in the culture and all of those kinds of things, right? And, and here, uh, here it's a little bit said tongue in cheek because uh, there's been such a focus on estuaries and emergence and natural metaphors and so forth that when we do something that feels a little bit like emergent, it's like, oh, that's OGME too. Or also when we're talking about how do you record and link up this massive information that everybody's generating, that feels OGME too. So there's a little, there's a little tongue in cheekness to it because it's like it's massive inchoate hairball information that we're gonna try to tackle, what? Um, but I, but I like exactly where you're pointing, which is like, how do we, and, and this was part of our mission at the, in the workshop was, how do we distill what OGM is good at and special for, as opposed to the game B people and the theory U people. And like there's, there's large crowds of people doing earnest work, solving interesting problems. Like how are we different and, and what do we contribute? And, and I think that goes directly to that. So here's something that's that's um, Kiko Labby and OGME and um, Future Howie yes. and it's it's uh, it's about harvesting, and what we're trying to do um, for us in the, from the workshop in our respective groups and as a whole um, OGM group that, that did the workshop and then for the others that are here and elsewhere that were not in the workshop then it's it's harvesting, um, and I just wanted to invite everyone uh, to the 23rd of November. North America and Europe, um, Kiko Labs having a harvest party. And so it's about harvesting what we've been doing and what we got and what, what's, what, what's on, the, on the feast table. And I think this is a useful metaphor, call it a natural metaphor, maybe not. It also relates very much to the pyragogy wrap as a pattern. And um, so we'll be, we'll be wrapping or harvesting, you know, what we've done, and, but also the, the, the protocols, the processes of harvesting itself. And there's the bridge over to back over to OGM. Check. Other thoughts on this? I think OGM -E keeps Schrodinger's cat alive longer. Mm. Yes. Well, uh, you know, I see OGM as open mind and that what characterizes us, us is a smart conversation from many points of view that are not integrated and pushed into a single uh, silo. And that the way we would interact with a client, for example, would be to invite them or invite us into their conversation where they get to watch us struggling with multiple points of view where they can identify with the parts that are meaningful to them. So the idea of pushing OGM into a single system uh, is not attractive to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm interested in OGM as process or verb or intention that is in some sense a little bit contagious so that there would be in the middle kind of an organizational structure and a core that is trying to nurture that thing, but that OGM in a spreads and, and, that, and that in some other community uh, they would they would be like oh uh, let's let's do something really OGME now and that would mean something to them. It's like let's use the Xerox means something to everybody right now, right? Let's Xerox that. Well, we're creating a new world in OGME ness <laughs> uh, that I think will be very catalytic and infectious and engaging of a larger community, which is a big part of my vision of OGM. The, the metaphor that, that occurs to me just as you started talking was that we are weavers or quilters or whatever you want to call it. And we still haven't figured out exactly what the needles are and what the yarn is made of. <clears throat> but we know that there's a big ball of yarn out there and that there's a whole bunch of people trying to make sense of the world by weaving, but that we've broken a lot of social ties. We've broken a lot of trust. We've, you know, science is being undermined. The, the world is really messy out there but we still know that we need to reweave the fabric of society and the fabric of decision-making for corporations and, and all of that. And so, and so I think part of our process here is to discover 
like what does the new knitting look like and what is the what does the loom look like that we're hanging these things on and how do we find threads and make that make very different yarns and threads compatible and how do we turn this thing into an attractive tapestry rather than a hairball yeah and you know along those lines you know some of the things i heard out of and you know obviously some people um you know, weren't in the workshop, but just to sort of bring people up. Some of the things that I heard is that there was some energy around um, what one of the languages that came out around questing, like actually doing something, right? Um, you know, there was one team that said, look, we need to get into the action because it's through the action that we will discover kind of who we are, whether that's, um, you know, whether that's uh, repairing um, and helping to rebuild the, you know, the, the place right next to UJ, right? And um, thinking about that, whether it was working on the food system or the education, like people had energy around kind of, you know, doing some, getting into the quest, right? And then build, letting that quest define, you know, the system and the support and the mechanisms and the world behind it. I also heard that some people were saying, well, I want to, I think we need to get into the, get into the lab and just start building tools and processes. And, you know, whether it's, we want to, we want to perfect personal knowledge management, or we want to talk about, you know, um, other, you know, ways that we share information and those things that was, there was sort of like the lab that is in support of the quest, right? Think about it as like, you know, um, for James Bond fans, it's like Q or the Bat Cave, or some people wanted to be in the Bat Cave inventing, you know, new tools and toys and all that stuff. I did hear, you know, and Judy, you were mentioning, I did hear people talk about needing a nerve center, needing, needing something that is, you know, um, helping to connect dots and hold this, hold some level of requisite shape and structure so that we can continue you know, to operate and that nerve center would define, you know, Thursday calls, Tuesday calls, whatever those things are, the mechanisms and all that kind of stuff that that was, that was important. And then I heard um, that we need, a, we need a manifesto, if you will, we need a shared, a shared point of view of our intentions of, you know, of when we say OGME, what do we mean by this, right? We needed that and then the and then the last thing that I really heard was this notion of how do we manage our network? How do we grow our network? How do we invite new people in? When do we invite new people in? And you know what are the things there? Um, you know those are kind of like for me different categories of stuff that needs to needs to be advanced. Now we you know part of that the manifesto piece is also this worldview creation. Part of the nerve center, I think is, you know, some governance things about, you know, what are, are there rules of engagement so that as we get into projects and do questing, how do we, do, you know, share resources and time and appreciate each other. So I think that there's, there are things that live underneath that that still need to be worked. The question is, do we need more of the whole conversation before we, start to focus in on different pieces or do we, can we do both? Can we have a whole conversation and focus in on pieces, right? Well, well we appear to have jumped straight into this conversation. I know, and I know people wanna talk, probably talk about the election too. Well, uh, so some of us do, some of us don't, I think. Um, what I liked about Ken's question was that it really wasn't about the election. It was about, and, and Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it was about the election has, is sort of a punctuating event for a lot of things and resets where we are and, may, and maybe resets our expectations of what the next several years will look like and what is possible and what's going on in, you know, what the background radiation looks like. Um, and to discuss what that opens up for us. Like what, and where, where individually we think we might orient in that space. And I'm, I'm probably um, taking your statement in lots of different directions, Ken. So why don't I pass it back to you and then to Klaus. 
You know, <clears throat> Peter Block says a really good, a very good question is slightly ambiguous. So what's important now is however you want to meet that, wherever it touches you, what is important for you right now? Um, I do agree that um, this election and the way it's dragging on and the anxiety it's producing um, is producing one set of, of feelings in me. And then there's also the fact that uh, I'm very surprised that it was so close. I thought it was going to be very different. And so clearly we have, um, to quote a, a, a former president, misunderestimated uh, the, the um, the reach and the brand of hatred and uh, divisiveness. And I think that's a wake up call. Um, it's really, to me, feels very important to start looking at, okay, um, if there's that much division, if there's that much us and them going on, then there's a different weaving that needs to go on. There's a, we are not doing a good job of listening um, and by we, I mean the big we, not not this group here, because I think we're all very good listeners. But culturally, we don't have a culture of listening to people, especially their stories, um, because there's so much suffering going on. As Doug pointed out a couple of calls ago, there's so many people who are losing their homes, who have lost their jobs, who have, have lost loved ones, um, and that that has been weaponized and turned into a, a bludgeon that has divided the country right down the middle to the point where it's razor thin and winner take all uh that's not the kind of system that i want to be participating in or supporting and yet i am at a loss of how to um uh how to turn that around um at least in this moment i'm just in kind of shock and so that's that's some of the things that are showing up as important for me Thank you. A, a brief thing then to Judy, and then if everybody will just sort of signal to me as you'd like to jump into the conversation. Um, one of my ahas yesterday, after seeing an article that said the Lincoln Project didn't move the needle like a couple points, um, I was very, very entertained by the videos and the ads that the Lincoln Project, which is made up of a bunch of conservative uh, pollsters and strategists who got together and said, screw this, we're, we're never Trumpers. Uh, they just started making a series of ads and putting them out there. Same thing with the Midas Touch and, and Republicans for, I forget, for, forgotten what it's called, but there were like three or four major groups that kept churning out really good ads. And I think I realized yesterday that they were making ads for the left. They were entertaining the left. They weren't permeating the right. And then it dawns on me that advertising is consumer mass marketing communications, they were sort of trying to advertise their way to victory, which is why all the campaigns were asking for so much money from everybody and why this was the most expensive campaign in the US ever. Yet we have this knife edge decision, partly because both sides were pouring money into it, but partly because this is not discourse or governance or community or anything of that nature. This is combat and it's consumer mass marketing combat, all of which led me to a, to, to a realization that what we're doing in this little group right here um, about opening minds and having conversations and sharing what we know might be more essential than ever. It might be really interesting to move forward. And then the subsidiary thought, which is that advertising tries to produce the quick win. It's like, we must, we need your money right now because we're going to throw ads at Georgia because this is happening. And what we're doing here is like slow, connective process. It's like roots reaching out to each other and figuring out what you, what do you need? What do I need? It's list, deep listening to people who we haven't talked to before. It's all of those things are part of this process. And, uh, and, and, and so I was like, well, hell, I, I felt like doubling down on this project and these conversations with you all because they seemed much more important than they had to me just even uh, like a, a couple of days before this election really hit us. So that's my, my own take. Uh, Judy, to you. When I thought about responding to what is important now, um, I was looking at this big picture of a divided nation, uh, antipathy escalating, and that, that what was really needed was healing and sharing and developing mutual understanding because polarization isn't usually very helpful. And so if there's a process, it's important that we embed that healing quality in what we do. And so I took the, you know, healing's most important and the, the big system is chaotic at best. So my sense is 
that this is a, a kind of good time to start local and reach out. Not necessarily local, like only your neighbor, but whatever you're already connected to, to put the energy toward those groups that's healing and questioning and bringing multiple viewpoints to a shared understanding. Because it's difficult to move off the pool if there isn't a shared understanding. Agreed. Um, Pete, Pete, uh, Pete, then Klaus. Sorry. Um, I I think the country is deeply divided, um, and and that's something that is going to take a long time to fix, and it's something we need to fix. Um, I just wanted to mention in here, somebody somebody I know that smart and technically savvy um, makes the point or supposes or asserts he asserts that um, uh, that a great deal of the the vote count was actually uh, hacked uh, ballot boxes uh, and not you know so so even though it kind of looks 50 50 um, the the actual votes may not have been 50 50 it might have been um, much different from that Thoughts? yeah um. Ken posted something uh, 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 that he wrote here uh, about Trump voters, which is which really resonates um, because there are macro trends uh, that uh, that are that are underway, which which really drive this insecurity and divisiveness in, in in our in our society right now. For example, artificial intelligence is in the process to. Uh, to take jobs from white collar workers, you not know, banks, insurances, and so on. So the 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 uh, this this pandemic uh, is accelerating this shift where uh, companies are laying off more people if on a permanent basis. These jobs will not come back. Um, unfortunately, like everyone else, I had hoped that the election would send a signal, you know, to to return back to a sense of normalcy and fixing problems that we need to engage like climate change and uh, social disruptions and so on. But that obviously is not going to happen. So we are in a longer period of, of disruption and divisiveness on the national level and even at, at state level. And we, we have at the same time an increasingly larger share of the population disenfranchised from this economy. And they don't see a, they don't see a way back. I mean, I don't know what a fifty year old bank teller who just got laid off is going to do, right? Um, so my my sense is, and I think that coming back to what Kevin was saying earlier, I mean, the solution really is local at community level, um, and it has to be it, it has to be a shift in the way that we. Uh, economically sustain ourselves, and, in, and I think it has to be in community. You know? So the the action is not at some national um, endeavor, but it has to be. Uh, we have to find some kind of macro structure within which a community can uh, organize and synthesize itself. Uh, so, so that, that was sort of my thought process that came out of our meeting last week. Then I, I think I think it, what Judy was saying, what Kevin is saying, you, you, you see this idea of we need to move towards local, but what does that really mean, right? You have to have some structure and organization to move into local. And, and, and the set of belief systems about what works, what doesn't work, how to approach, how not to approach. I think those things we have to sort of bake through as well. Um, Kevin has been working on neighborhood economics for years now uh, and is sort of uh, deep, deep into this at the, you know, where, where the rubber meets the road. And Kevin, if, you, if you'd like to jump in, but also have uh, Jay was waiting for the floor. So, but Kevin, if you want to explain <clears throat> some of what you've been Yeah, uh, in fact, you know, we are... Uh just put the link to the presentation we're giving today to a bunch of uh, loan funds. Um, yeah, we're, we're working on an interconnected economy as opposed to an economy of uh, rugged individualism. And uh, all the uh, economic innovations are definancializing and keeping the assets local and democratically elected. 
this thing we're doing today is kind of interesting. It's, it's a friends and family fund for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle. Uh, so you need to, you know, if your uncle Mort gives you money for your startup, he's not going to attach your Toyota Corolla, right? It's going to be like equity. And so we're making it like equity, but you get a deduction going in and you get lifetime income. We think it's going to be really valuable. And, and, and uh, I think the other part that's interesting is that there are a lot of new uh, community economic development funds that are trying to, you know, get capital to minority entrepreneurs, but they're not ready for debt. You know, they don't have collateral and they don't, they don't have two years clean financial. So this is revenue share that gets you up to that level and then you get debt in a couple of years. So we want it to be bolted on beneath all the cities that are trying to do something about this. And they realize that, you know, <clears throat> the gap is friends and family. And uh, we, can, we can do that in a really interesting way. We, we've modified something that was uh, created by Stanford called the Pooled Income Fund to, to let uh, donors uh, give but get lifetime income. Uh, so that donor, you could put go in for hundred dollars, or you could, you know, put the proceeds of your IPO there and, and uh, avoid capital gains tax. So it's anyway, I think we're working on a bunch of those things like that. But we, I think this is a real easy one to uh, to uh, replicate in a lot of places where. People are already realizing that these debt funds don't, uh, the people who you want to reach can't actually, they're not ready to tote the note. So it's friends and family for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle. And this is one of many, I think, locally oriented, really great solutions. And this is at the finance mm -hmm. level and other ones would be at right. the, how do you create structural incentives to shift from industrial farming to regenerative agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but, sure. but if mm -hmm. we can sort of lather and repeat on those kinds of things, ob observing and evolving some general principles of our own about how do we do that? How are we helpful to you and you know, that effort while, while figuring out our own secret sauce? Um, Jay, did you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks. Um, does anybody else watch Fox News? Okay, so a couple, a couple, few of us. Um, I, I do my best to uh, go back and forth to try to uh, listen and kind of track what what the narrative is that that is appearing. I think it, there's kind of a basic thing that I believe, which is that the um, the right is uh, are, are much much better storytellers uh, in general than the left. Um, maybe like a level of a difference of like a, a maybe an eight to a four, um, which is which is pretty significant. Um, the you know there's a gap because it's not necessarily the, the the purpose of the storytelling is not necessarily connective across the whole. The purpose of the storytelling is kind of um, connective inside the pod. Um, so that it doesn't really matter what the other group feels. So it's, so both parties are using fear. One's using fear and they're both using fear as, as division. Um, but Fox news and that kind of side is if you listen and you can like write off the, Oh, it's your, the, the stolen ballots and the, Oh, that, you know, we could say, Oh, what are you talking about? We're, this is going to win. Um, I just listen. Um, and I listen for what they're trying to say and how that relates to what uh, the president is saying. And my concern is that um, we're, we're just, the, the goal here is, is, the goal is further separation, kind of radical separation. Um, and so I know that's been on the march, but now we're at a moment. Um, and so I'm just kind of in that place of, not, not that it's going away anytime soon, but what do stories look like that actually cast vision instead of um, cast horror? Um, and, and how does that relate to what everyone acts on on a daily basis? So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. And, um, I, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just add on that I love the, that vision exercise that we did two weeks ago um, as well, the, the kind of looking back from from five years, and I'm and I'm curious about the context of where where that's fitting in the process going forward as well. As am I, because I, I don't know that many of our teams in the workshop used a lot of that material in our work. 
And so I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that much of our vision, our backcasting from 2025, our, fu our future histories, are are in the discussion yet. And I think those need to be filtered in as well because they like they were important. Uh, so let me go. Let me go back to the question Ken posed to us: What's important now? Yeah, I'm just going to add one more phrase. That the the thing that really strikes me now that struck me when I was staring at the white face of. Um, George Washington cast against the Black Hills last month um, is it's a question of divergent evolution. So we're, we're, we're being reinforced into a kind of divergent evolution. And the challenge is, um, I think the challenge is to, to practice realignment, like radical realignment. And the process of that realignment involves figuring out distilled wisdom about what we see and how to act in the world. And then instantiating that as some kind of manifesto, which could turn into, I mean, uh, Pete and uh, Marc Antoine and a couple of us are working on a pattern language approach toward this, which would be um, basically small stories nested in each other and linked to each other that tell a larger story about how to go about doing things in a way that's sort of practical and community built. So, uh, we're gonna we're gonna come back to the general uh, the general call here uh, in 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 some moment when we're when we've got that ready. But basically say, hey everybody, we've got we're trying to evolve a pattern language to describe what it is we do and what we think this is. Um, that so uh, w one second. Jay just asked, uh, can I define story in which context do you mean, Jay? Uh, you yeah. talked about nested stories, um, mm -hmm. which I'm really intrigued by, but I just wanted to clarify terms. I was, um, I was sort of adding what you had said about stories back into the notion of pattern languages and interpreting a pattern as a short story, which it kind of is. And I, those of you who are pattern aficionados, you know, you can either jazz hands or, ja or jazz hands down. Uh, but, but in a sense, uh, a well-sculpted pattern language around some domain uh, contains memorable, retellable patterns, retellable stories. And so my favorite is light on two walls uh, from a pattern language, which is a pattern language for designing uh, villages down to homes, right? And that's the domain of that particular pattern language. So one of them in the middle, and this one has 253 patterns, uh, but the one of them in the middle says, a room to feel inviting, warm, hospitable should probably have light coming at it from two walls. And, and this is distilled wisdom of good designers. And now when you walk into a place, you'll be like, oh, that's why this place is almost working, but not quite, is that there's just one, one window on the street and there's no other light coming in and it feels kind of dead that way. But, but, but light on two walls is, a, is like a short story. Um, and it's, it's, it's like, remember, there was this exercise, six word stories, right? Uh, baby shoes uh, for sale, baby shoes, never used. Right, that's the most famous six word story out there. Um, uh, and, and so a good pattern language is like a, that repeated and then woven together in a way that is intentionally easy for newbies to digest and then experience and then start applying. Scott, go ahead. Um, two quick things, one right off of what you just said. I noticed something, I could be wrong, but I noticed that, that Trump's messages tend to be, have fewer syllables. <laughs> His language is so one and two syllable words that they're just, they're just easy for anyone to understand. And that, that I think helps, helps make that, and they're very visual. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is, is a personal story about how we can get some of this stuff to spread. So I'm the oldest in my family and I wanna talk about mimicry very quickly. So mimicry is a social thing. We do what other people, other people do. My wedding was my first wedding I'd ever been to. College was the first college I had ever been to. Uh, when I had my first child, it was the first child in my group that had ever, you know, out of all of my friends. And so I always felt like I was on the edge, on the front, and it always was a scary place to be. And a lot of what I see this group doing is saying, we're gonna be the big brother, the big sister going first. 
because that, that that's huge, I think, for people. I'm thinking about some of the things that that you know we're we're talking about here, and I think, wow, this sounds like a great place to be over here. And yet getting there, that's that's really scary because I don't know how to get there. And that's just my simple framing of that is that, you know, how do we be a big brother, big sister, someone who goes first and says, follow me. This is safe over here. We've done it before. Um, and Scott, apropos Trump's communicational style, uh, in the, after the 2016 election, Scott Adams, who was a big proponent of Trump's, uh, and, and before that election, he and Scott Adams is the writer of Dilbert, the cartoon, right? Um, and he published a series of really, really useful and interesting analytic articles about Trump's style and how the repetition of really simple things uh, taught things. And, and I, I, I then, based on that and a bunch of other input, recorded a bunch of videos about trying to understand Trump. And one of the, one of the things I realized was that um, in, in the week after the election, my buddy Al asked me, so Jerry, what was, uh, what, what, if, if Hillary had won this election, what was she going to do on Inauguration Day? And I was like, uh, 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 I'm, I don't know, make sure Pell Grants don't go away. <clears throat> and then he asked the $64,000 question, which now doesn't seem like a lot of money. But uh, he then said, so what is Trump going to do on Inauguration Day? He's going to build a big, beautiful wall. He's going to block my, you know, Muslims from entering the country. He's going <clears> to, <throat> you know, and, and he had trained me in his entire goddamn agenda, which I found abysmal and, hor and horrific, but I had been perfectly trained in reciting the agenda. <clears throat> and that's about storytelling. And that's about, that's about stories that are reaching in and latching on somewhere other than the logical, rational brain about what makes sense to do, what is a humane thing to do. Like, like these are stories that bypass our humane instincts in many ways, and they're latching onto something else entirely. So, I, and, and I think hacking these stories, so one of the more, more important thoughts in my brain is um, emotion and membership trump logic or reason most of the time. And, and part of the re that's part of the existence of OGM is that, is that on the one hand, I believe in preserving memory, gardening it, sculpting it into something that's useful later and ongoing, and that maybe the logic of that might be, might convince people. And on the other hand, I believe what I just said, which is like, you know what? Logic flies right out the window when agreeing with your logic means I might be ostracized from my tribe. And so we need to sort of figure that out. Ken, then Klaus. So um, some of you were saying just triggered a memory for me. Back in the 90s, I knew a woman by the name of Fran Peavy, who um, was part of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and a, a author of uh, an article called Strategic Questioning. And Fran had gone to Rwanda after the genocide and asked people what happened before people started hacking each other up? What was going on? And Rwanda did not have television, but they had radio stations. And the radio stations were broadcasting these messages of, and by the way, if you Uh oh, Ken, Ken. We, we, we we've lost you. You froze. No, Ken, come back. There is a gremlin inside of Zoom that Be understands. And as I listen to he's Trump, he's having internet trouble with his service providers. Yeah, um, Ken, if you want to turn off your video and go back like three sentences. This divisiveness of we're going to make an enemy out of people who have traditionally been seen as leaders. Ken? So. Uh, your connection froze on us about three sentences oh, back, four sentences sorry. back. Sorry. Okay. So I, I'm listening to. I tell you, the Zoom gremlins, gremlins are really good at this. <laughs> Especially they notice if somebody's leaning in about to make like an important point and then. It... That's right. <clears throat> it's like the death scene, you know, what you really need to know is. <laughs> exactly uh and it's it's hilarious that ken is still off the air here <clears throat> um yeah, I'm wondering, is it? Uh, let's go to klaus and let's get ken back when his uh, connection is a little better yeah ken maybe you turn your video off that, that may help yeah. so so there, there have been multiple studies trying to understand the mindset between what's what you perceive as liberal versus conservative 
And it seems one of the defining differences is the capacity to handle change. Um, <clears throat> and there are links to IQ uh, that, uh, that uh, are connected here as well. Uh, so the, the capacity of, uh, uh, of cognition, uh, the, the, the uh, cognitive uh, capacity of a person to handle multiple data points. Um, but but uh, the, the uh, overriding difference seems to be the, the ability to handle change and to become very upset and very uh, 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 insecure when change is happening too fast. Um, and of course, the, everything we experience right now, even in, when you look at our own careers, right, starting uh, with uh, punch cards and then moving into uh, an iPhone uh, and the, the transition to all this. A lot of people were unable to handle that and who are, who are now stuck in jobs that have morphed uh, into, into technology uh, that, that uh, is beyond, is, 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 is challenging to keep up with. But then also in the social environment, you know, the way that you do banking, the way that, uh, uh, you handle mail and all of these things. It is it is overwhelming a, a lot a, a large part of the population. So Trump is appealing you know, to that notion of saying we'll make it good again. You know we'll we'll stabilize it again. We'll go back to uh, making America great again. So he signals um, to to this population that is so overwhelmed by change uh, that uh, we can stop this and we can go back to normal. You know? Um, a couple comments on, on what you just said, Klaus. I'm, I'm leery of any theory, any overarching theory that says that, con that conservatives or Trumpists don't process information well or are afraid of change, or, because they're, they're actually, some of them are trying to provoke dramatic change that the left is trying to avoid and paper over. So, so I'm unclear that, that you know, avoidance of change is, is like the overarching thing. And I think also that framing framing these people as somehow <clears throat> less able to cope. With oh, you piece of heavy, shit. Heavy thinking. <laughs> Ken, are you back? Uh, you're unmuted. So that was the first thing that came back into the conversation. And I think that the, that the Zoom gremlins are working overtime today. That was <laughs> the next thing he'll be having a shower in the background. You watch. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I've been having all these network issues and I keep dropping out. And so I didn't realize that I was actually back on when I, when it looked like I dropped out again. I think that was perfect. Was, was, it was, it was perfect. Was gonna, perfect. Oh, right you now. piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> Will you just shut up, man? <laughs> yeah, <what are> you <laughs> doing That's kind of that's the best piece of social commentary I've heard coming out of America. Uh, yeah, that's, that was very, that's very That was very OGM-y, Ken. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, that was good. Was um, good. So let me finish what I was saying and then Ken, Ken, pass it back to you to see if you can go back and restart your brain where you were. Although I think you just fell off the call. No, you think you slipped into a different window for me. Okay, <clears throat> there you are, good. Um, and let me see if I can find my thread, which was, um, I'm leery. So, so uh, when people don't seem intelligent or whatever, like if you poke under the covers very often, they can recite baseball stats back to 1931, and they know exactly. Like if you find the domain that they give a damn about, <clears throat> they're perfectly smart. Like they they got memory, they got quick, they've got they've got whatever. It's it's like it's it's on deck. It's just hidden behind something because the thing we want them to perform on right now is uninteresting, irrelevant, or whatever. Uh, or, or, or uh, they're, they're, visceral obje they're viscerally objecting to the thing we're asking them to perform highly on. So, so I think all of that is sort of swimming in our, in our medium. And, and I'd like to bring us back to what's important now and away from the analyses and digestions, because I think a part of what we can do together is these analyses and digestions uh, as we sort of get into, okay, so how do we approach this group? And we can set up an experiment and that experiment can go run off and try something. And a different experiment might, might be in the same domain and try a different theory of change or a different theory of, of what's up. And I think that's exciting and interesting for OGM to, to engage in. And not that we have to invent all those experiments, but we can identify who's, who's actually busy doing that and go help them do it and incorporate their, their learnings and their results and bake that into what we think we know and how we offer that to other people. So long, long way around a, a bunch of different thoughts. Uh, Ken, back to you in the booth. Okay, so this is 
coming at a totally different um, time now. But what I was saying is I, I knew this one friend, PB, who um, best known for uh, back in the 80s, I think she was in Europe and she set up a table and two chairs with a sign that said American willing to listen. And people would just come and talk to her and say, what's going on? She says, I'm just here to listen. And she heard all kinds of things. But she went to Rwanda after the genocide and asked the people what was going on right before the genocide occurred. And they did not have TV, but they had radio stations. And the radio stations were putting out these horrible messages about the other. And what is really frightening to me is the othering that is coming out of the Oval Office with the horrible pictures that are happening in democratically controlled states and democratically controlled cities. Suddenly, the Democrats and Republicans move from being the opposition to each other, which is we move through opposition. You can't move if you don't have left and right. They have to work in tandem. In fact, when I was in Kansas a few years ago, I asked everybody who was a, a red uh, person to plant their right foot. And everyone who was a left uh, a blue person plant their left foot and walk, and they just went in a circle, right? You need both to move. So um, it's really scary to me that there is this narrative emerging that is being gobbled up by many people that the Democrats are the problem and the Democrats are the enemy. I really don't want to be in a, in a country where a political party is suddenly the enemy of the state. That's very, very frightening to me. And I'm really concerned about how to counter that narrative at the local level. At national level, I don't know, but local level, I can talk to people. Jerry, you've often told the story of the, the black man who has all the Ku Klux Klan robes. You know, how can you hate me if you don't know me? How can we hate each other if we know each other? So to me, that's one of the most local things we can do is reach out and start talking to people that we might see as other. And it takes a little time, gosh darn it. And it doesn't have instant responses like advertising sometimes does when it works or goes viral or whatever. But it's, it's like the fa the re there's a reason we use the word fabric to talk about society. We talk about the fabric of society because all the warp and the weft of, of the fabric is all those little interconnections between humans. It's, it's us sitting together over meals. It's us sharing you know, childcare. It's us solving problems for neighbors. It's, it's us doing those things. And also in a lot of neighborhoods in the middle of the country, that fabric is much stronger than it is in urban centers where we're mostly aliens to each other. And so when, when your tractor burns and you can't bring in your crop, your neighbors will show up and they'll be like, all right, we got this and, and figure it out. And you leave your keys in your car and you know, all the things that we sort of hear about are in fact, I think still active in places that are not getting attention in other ways. Um, so let me go back to the question uh, of what's important now to us given the sort of sharp punctuation that this election is giving us, Doug. So um, we're clearly struggling here over what's the uh, the narrative frame that's most helpful. The one that I hold is not well shared, but it goes like this: the Democrats used to be the party of labor and they became the party of the professional class. And the result was that no, neither party represents the bulk of the uh, lower half of the population. So people are really upset because there's no narrative which really deals with the situation as they feel it. The Democrats abandoned the, a large part of the population and that's a key driver from the past that leads us to where we are now. And if the Democrats don't face up to that in some way by kind of an apology for what the Clintons did in moving the country towards uh, uh, neoliberalism, uh, the Democratic Party is not uh, set up to represent the population, even half of it or even a third of it. So that to me is the core driver of the narrative we are in. And the way I like to, to approach a problem like this is where are we? How did we get here? And what can happen? And given that, what should we do? Um, and Doug, 
I maintain narratives like what you just said in my brain, and I just sent a link to one about Bill Clinton bought the neoliberal agenda, which is connected back up to how the left bought the neoliberal agenda and, and ignored the middle class and all of that. And one of the things I actually enjoy is layering on narratives like that in this context that I, that I curate. I, I, I love that. And conversations where I learn more about history or somebody else's idea about what happened when the Mongols hit the, the Great Wall of China and bounced toward Europe and blah, 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 blah. And then, and then everybody starts contributing things. Th those to me are ex really exciting conversations because they change my theories of change about why things are happening in the present and how we might go about doing things in the future. Um, and to me, that, that, that's very OGM-y. It's, it's, like, <clears throat> it's like sort of curating the story of how we got here and why we do things and what we should do together. Um, and, and our tools to do this are still like incredibly limited. Uh, so back to what's important now. Else. Yeah, I would, I would argue that this whole conversation circles us right back to community because at community is where we have relationship and the only way to connect is through relationship and um, building relationship uh, can be done through helping uh, and, and to, to, to uh, creating support structures. Um, I think the national conversation, even the state level conversation is so polluted at this point that um, uh, it, it, we, we will not see uh, anything happening at the, at the macro level for some time. And what's cool is that we can see lots of things happening at the micro level, at the fractal level, at the community level, at the local level. Uh, Matt, then Hank. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't disagree that um, community and acting in a way that's kind of on the ground and living in the terrain is um, is an important mechanism for the ch you know for change, right? I think that that's I think you know we talked about um, you know healing, you know we talked about wounds being open. Um, Neil, you referenced that. You know, you need to let them air, you need to show them to the light, there needs to be vulnerability, but a healing is this, you know, in some ways is this radical realignment that we're talking about. And you get that through real human to human connection um, and, and those things. I think at the same time though, um, I, I'm really troubled by the fact that um, we have yet to define a meta narrative that people can attach their own personal experiences to that are different than the meta narratives that we currently have in place. Um, and I think that, I think simultaneously, that's why I think the local global thing is a little bit problematic to me. Um, it, you know, we're dealing with a system that's been built up over years of time that have embedded mental models you know, in them and these narratives that everybody is operating under. And we're all struggling to sort of figure out how to maintain those, you know, maintain those, you know, those mental models and those meta narratives through our own action. And I think, I think they're just fundamentally flawed. I think human beings took a wrong turn in terms of our language and metaphors and mental models. And those things have to be reset and they have to be reset at the scale in which they currently operate. And unfortunately, we've gotten to a point where the scale of our meta narratives are operating globally, right? Um, and so, um, and there are things like, um, you know, the, the role of consumption empowering the economy, right? I mean, all of our growth was powered by kind of this idea of an unlimited supply of and the unlimited use of resources that we pulled from the ground. And the reality is we're reach, we've reached the end of that. And unless you fundamentally change, I, I think that's a problem. So while operating locally and having good connections and doing little micro interventions and you know, Hamilton and I were discussing this and debating this the other day, I think the, I think the challenge is, um, you know, the challenge is unless we fundamentally reshift the way we think as a, as a species, we're destined to keep making the same 
mistake and perpetuate the same existence that we've, we've been on, um, which is built out of the industrial age um, and built out of views of the way that science is supposed to be the cure-all for religion. And, you know, and we're still holding on to all that stuff. So I, I, I think it's a profound, there's a, we have to catalyze a profound shift in thinking and we might have to connect locally with people to engage them in that profound thinking. Cause I have a lot of friends in Michigan that I'm friends. Well, but I, I have a lot of friends in Michigan that are really close people to me that I know voted for Trump. And I know don't believe the same things, but but we've had, we're starting to have those conversations, but until I have a narrative that resonates with them, they're going to have this unwillingness, you know, to change. And um, so I, I don't know. I think we have to start, we have to start by defining an ethos that works for everybody. A quick, a quick thought before I pass the mic to Hank, <clears throat> which is, um, so the three words I've heard kill more interesting projects are it won't scale. Uh, because, and, and my own theory on that is that I, I've got this thing I call design from trust. And, and I wrote an, an essay called uh, the two O shits because when you hit systems that are designed from trust they seem completely counterintuitive and broken and like they're never gonna scale, they're never gonna work, but they work like Wikipedia. The, the first oh shit is, oh shit, this will never work. Well, who was the idiot that designed an encyclopedia? Anybody in the world could come in and change. The second oh shit is, oh, this seems to be working. How does it work? I'd like a little more, <clears throat> which is why I wrote Toxoplasmosis and When Harry Met Sally, because I think one of the best mechanisms for change is either um, I'll have what they're, what she's having, you know, what, what, at the scene when Rob Reiner's mom is in the diner and, and, uh, <clears throat> and Billy Crystal, you know, Meg, Meg, Meg Ryan basically fakes an orgasm at the table in the diner. Remember that scene? It's a memorable scene. I would like to have that happen socially everywhere so that by contagion and by picking up what people do, people start changing their behavior. Toxoplasmosis is the thing that makes mice unafraid of rats. <clears throat> so it, it changes the rat, the, the mouse's brain. So it goes up and, 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 and like, and make, and suddenly gets eaten by, by a cat and propagates the toxoplasmosis uh, bacterium or virus. I forget what it is <clears throat> anyway, but so, so, large scale theories of change that you then engage publics with don't work for me as well as engagement with the belief system that then replicates through contagion or natural propagation. And that then cascades into large scale change that I call adaptive scale because it won't scale is industrial scale or engineering scale or mechanistic scale. And I, I've lost my belief in that as a general mechanism for, for fashioning a better society because it, it doesn't really work. But if you tell stories and, and help people envision what their future might look like and then help them when they ask for help, instead of coming in with your theory of change, often that actually works and sticks, right? So I'm trying to figure out what does that look like as an operating system going forward? And to me, uh, that involves storytelling, a whole big bunch, um, b both from the practical storytelling of here's what happens when you plant trees near a savanna and how you can re read, you know, a reverse desertification, but also storytelling for the emotional engagement of, of what life would be like if we only did this other thing here. So uh, Hank, then Kev, uh, Hank, Kevin, Jay, and then Hari. Hank's gone. Oh, Hank's gone. So uh, sorry, Kevin, Jay, Hari. Okay, and just one thing about gloom. I was oddly enough, I was talking uh, about five years ago to eight Episcopal bishops and they'd gotten this gloomy uh, economic forecast. And I came up with this line that I still believe in. I said, you know, the times are too late and the situation too dire to be anything other than firmly hopeful. And that's still what I believe. So fuck them all. Um, Jay, then Hari. Uh, yeah, two things. First of all, you know, my belief, my operating principle around this is that each of us has many stories that can build into one story with, with shaping and refinement um, to hold those many stories. And that each of us in our one bigger story can add together to make an even greater story. Um, in order to do that, we have to orient ourselves around some terms and approach in order to kind of see 
what we use, how we use that word in this in a similar way. But I think we it would be a worthy experiment to figure out what our story is um, through our stories. Um, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. I like that a lot. Thank you, Hari. Then Judy. Um, yeah. So uh, this may be a little <laughs> like uh, I mean a bit of a jump, but. I've just been listening to this and, you know, if I think of the dynamics of the system, right, uh, maybe the question shouldn't be what's important now, but what's going to be important in a very short time or some other time span, because, uh, I mean, how long could it continue like this, right? Dynamic systems oscillate. So, uh, you know, if your level of polarization was some kind of indicator, then it would oscillate too, right? Unless it was like damped or like a degenerate or I don't know, something like this. And I think the other thing which I really liked uh, was the idea of connecting to people through stories. And, um, you know, I, I heard the description of like uh, love 2.0 or something as like when you talk to somebody and uh, you have like a positivity resonance with them. And maybe that's a, it's a great way to, you know, like uh, be a change agent to, 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 to sort of do that. And finally, when it comes to stories, uh, I would hate to hear the same old story again and again and again. So maybe novelty is a hook for people and communities and stories, you know? So just some thoughts. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, Judy? I just think that if we're going to attempt to take action, there's a sense of cohesiveness and optimism and potential for positive outcome in this group. That's a core value that just ties us together and a desire to make the world better for everyone but it's so disrupted that i don't think we can tackle it on a big scale i think it starts almost person to person with i want to be cooperative with you and i think there's hope that we can make things better and if we just could get that message spreading as broadly as possible because maybe if one person hears it they'll say to someone else you know, I had a good conversation Tuesday with, and, and the gist of it was just this, <laughs> and it got me thinking. That could be a positive infectious activity. One of, one of, um, Lauren, I'll pass it to you in just a sec. One of, one of my favorite things that I saw yesterday in the insane tweet stream uh, was a woman who had just become a representative in Missouri <clears throat> and got on the microphone and said, hey, constituents, I am the newly elect representative and I love you. And because I love you, I want your life to be better. I want you to make sure you have clean water because I love you. She just went on and on like a preacher and it was beautiful. It was 40 seconds, <clears throat> it was not long, but it was really beautiful. And, um, and she was speaking to everybody in her constituency, but she was also saying, I want you to have a better life, you know, a life as good as uh, the people who don't look like you. Right, so she was also speaking uh, to people of color, um, but but it was a broad, broad message. It was lovely, um, Lauren. Um, you know, during the Iraq War, they uh, they the the U.S. developed something called shock and awe, which was like such an overwhelming force that Iraqis would just be bowled over and. But anyway, that's not a bad strategy, and we certainly. Um, how can I say this? Um, we don't really have the meta narrative, but maybe we can do um, some kind of local mission. And when I say local, I mean something that we could a uh, problem that we could handle or the problem that we could solve and do it amazingly for an example to point to um, where we actually can do something amazing and we feel powerful and um, we shock people by the some little amazingness that's small but manageable. <laughs> um, brief excursion into uh, history of war. There's a book written called Command of the Air by a general, an Italian general, Giulio Duhet, uh, who's the father of strategic bombing. And he basically said, we're going to end all wars because no country is going to like bombing. Like the, we, we had just invented the bomber. And his conclusion was that bombers are going to just eliminate warfare uh, because the people will rise up, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that he was dead wrong, completely wrong. 
that we have dropped insane amounts of ordnance on Germany and Vietnam. Like we dropped more bombs on the country of Vietnam than we dropped in all of World War II. And Laos. Um, I'd have, I'd have, pardon? And Laos. And Laos, yeah, Vietnam and Laos, exactly. Um, and, and, and the people didn't rise up and, and turn against. In fact, you know, we lost Vietnam. Uh, so shock and awe to me is, is what we try when we don't actually have a better answer. <clears throat> and one of the reasons I don't, one of, the, one of the, the reservations I have about the EXO movement, the exponential organizations movement, is that the way their sprints work inside of organizations is through shock and awe. It's like, we're going to show them that the fourth industrial revolution basket of technologies is just going to overwhelm them. And if, unless they change and start adopting them now, they're dead. And I'm like, I'm not sure that's your best opening salvo, but it sort of works. Like it loosens things up. Anyway, um, shock and awe is like really a strange uh, new ingredient, old ingredient, new ingredient in this formula of how do you get people to wake up and change? And I, and I think a big piece of our conversation here is that, is like, how do we get people to change? And we all have uh, our own conceptions about that. So Ken, then Lauren, and then Doug. So in my work over the years, one of the things I've discovered that is among the most powerful um, tools in my, in my kit is not talking, but having people um, spend some time eye gazing, pairing up and just looking into someone's eyes for five minutes. Um, it is amazing the stuff that happens when, when that goes on. And I think that's one of the most critical things that we can bring when we're able to be back in physical space together. Um, that, and I, I also have paired this with some of Joanna, Macy, Joanna Macy's work around uh, doing a, a narrative of, um, can you see this person as a baby when they first came into the world? Can you see them on their deathbed? Can you see the, the uh, sorrows that they're carrying? And um, can, you, can you understand, uh, can you get a sense of how great it would be to work with them, with their brilliance, with their intelligence, with their genius, with their ideas? Um, I've done this in, in groups, you know, uh, and it, it's really, it changes, I, I call it softening the, the collective body. It just, it makes everybody so open. And I've done this with people who are very resistant. They come in and they're like, and it's, it is really, really potent. So I just want to throw that out that this is one of the things that is available that we can be doing. There was a beautiful advertisement and I'm not a big fan of ads, but there was a beautiful ad for a health system somewhere. I think I put it in my brain, so I'll find it, uh, where they walked through a hospital and then stopped at each character and told a little bit of the backstory of the character. Like the person standing next to you in the hospital had just received notice that they had like stage four cancer and the person over there was expecting a baby and the person over there had this and it's like everybody you walk through has their own journey and be mindful of this in our hospital kind of, it was just it was simple and beautiful um so thank you and and there are very lovely simple ways of making this bringing this into a room as you just described I there's also that. the stuff from tv2 in denmark have you seen their their ads um all that we share tv2 denmark all that we share check that out it's I really think so. let's find those uh um, lauren then doug yeah Oh, it's kind of weird now because I was just kind of like briefly responding to your comment. Um, but uh, what what I was trying to express is just, um, you know, we can't like fix the problem, uh, like a grand scaled problem of two people, uh, a Republican and a, you know, Democrat. Maybe we could fix someone's Thanksgiving and... <laughs> And maybe that's all we can do right now. Maybe we can make one family's Thanksgiving like really awesome. <laughs> and we might just have to live with that. That's what we're capable of. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think in, individuals have scales of change that they are more comfortable with, and and there are people who want to change the entire system with a better narrative and write Das Kapital. Uh, and there are people who go and help the family get fed the next week and have a, a, a shelter. Um, and, and we find our ways into the system. And, and we aspire to affect the system at different scales, but I think we have preferences and we, we take action at, at different scales. Um, Doug. Okay, I think we're talking as though ideas can enter into the current state of affairs and make a difference. I think that's leaving out that events are gonna happen that are huge first. 
for example, the failure of the food system or uh, a small number of evictions with people just living in the street in front of our houses. Uh, those are the things we're going to need to respond to. But we don't have to start the story. It's going to be going on. And we have to enter into the fact that it's already happening. Totally agree and would love, I'll go to Jay then Neil, uh, and would love to figure out how OGM could help resource those things that are going to hit us such that those situations are better prepared, better facilitated, better dealt with. I don't know exactly what I'm what I mean by that, but but how how do we think ahead of what these problems are going to be and try to make help figure out who's doing it and make those resources more available? Uh, Jay then Neil. I also totally agree. Thank you, Doug. Um, I also am thinking about what kinds of events might on the shadow side occur in the next coming days and weeks. Um, as everybody's glued and cortisol is like pumping and people are like, we're going to win or we're going to lose and what kind of, um, you know, what can happen in Nevada or what, you know, again, like the objective of the current regime to, um, to cause epic disconnection and how do you recipe that uh, because you, if you've got four conflicts that erupt in four different places and it's played over a million times and people look up and feel that they are surrounded by civil war, for example, just kind of shadow territory, my fear speaking, um, what is a remedy for that? Um, so, and, and I look at it as not necessarily ideas, but kind of ideas about action and ideas about connection kind of going with the group. So totally not exclusive. I think it's a complete, for me, a yes and. Love that, thank you. Neil and Ken. I'm sitting here in Belgium watching a lot of Americans talking about the collapse of their society. Um, I'm sitting here watching the failure of your institutions. I'm sitting here watching democracy bastardized. Um, I'm sitting here watching a country that's 50-50 on the knife edge of potentially civil war. Um, you've got a centre center west that uh, is incapable of seeing eye to eye with the people on either side of them on the coasts. Um, I'm seeing divisive tribalism and it pains me to my heart because the things you're talking about are essential but not enough, right? And healing is not going to be enough. This acceptance is needed. You need to accept this has failed. This experiment has failed. You have to grieve the loss of that and you have to move on to something bigger and better. You need to disrupt coherence compassionately in the words of Peggy Holman. You then need to engage those, dis those disruptions creatively, again, the words of Peggy Holman, and you have to renew coherence wisely. Now to renew coherence wisely, you have to have some anticipated expectation of a potential design. And to make that, make that viable, it has to actually meet and face reality. We are in the midst of an ecological and social collapse. We have climate chaos coming at us and your democracy has failed, right? You're about to see the small scale institutional, sorry, the small scale individual implications of that. Now, I grieve for you. I feel for you. I want to help you. It's not going to happen through just small projects. It's not going to happen through just big language. It needs a vertical coherence between those that can operate with levels of complexity above those who can only do a garden and those who can only do a garden, right? And all of the levels in between. And it's not to say gardens are simple. I've just been working in mine, that's why I was late. So we need to recognize the ecological implications of this. This is a, so a complex social system, a living system, a complex adaptive reflexive system and anything you can do to get people to reflect on where the fuck they are individually and where they fuck they are collectively and do something about that collectively, the better off you'll all be. We're watching from this side of the world in pain, fear and grief for what you had, what you have thrown away on your watch before these crises came along, right? And now the crises are here and I can't see it healing. I can see small scale opportunities for people to be better individuals and collectives in a collapsing society. And to me, the anticipatory design of communities that might work a bit longer, not just prepping individually, that might work a bit longer, is a critical element of this. 
and Doug's model around garden communities and so on is one of those exemplars. Uh, Klaus's stuff at the regenerative agriculture level is another, but the big picture core, what are the ethics that we operate by and how do we reflect those in everything we do together are so critical to changing the narrative. Doesn't matter how many small narratives there are if they don't line up with the big picture, right? We can tell stories about hope, but if we actually look out the window and see what's happening, it's scary as shit. And I'm, my heart is with you. So forgive my passionate embrace. I've, I've sat here and listened to an hour and a half of fear, pain, and confusion. And with a mix of uh, hope and aspiration and uh, optimism, I think. Um, I agree with you, Neil. Um, but I think also, uh, sorry, Ken and Judy, I'll pass it to you in a second. Um, I was going to wait for a second, but I'll just put this in. Like, um, I, I attended a Scott Peck workshop. He wrote The Different Drum, which was a, about community building. And it was a really interesting workshop. And his model, his model made me think that basically stress actually forges communities, that, that most communities that think they're communities are actually in pseudo community. And that when things get tough, they would leave. They would sooner leave than actually help. And, and that stress forms the diamond, whatever you want to call it. But, but that in moments of stress is when we discover each other, when we have to help each other, that's actually the creation of true community. So I think we're, we're being faced by a series of dilemmas, including a, a, an uber dilemma of the polarization of discourse and the, sh and the fragment and the shattering of discourse worldwide, because, it, it, because it, it's, a, it's a useful tool for creating power, for, for holding power. Um, and, and I think part of our quest here together is how to undermine those problems and how to how to feed solutions to one another and how to act differently in the world so that we can overcome these things. But but at the end of that process, we will have forged a better community because because had Hillary Clinton won the election in 2016, I realized afterwards she was a steward of the status quo. <clears throat> And we we would not have faced the stuff. I have thought in my brain silver linings of, about Trump. And and one of the silver linings is he just showed us ourselves. He, he just opened up a bunch of conversations we would not have had yet because he just tore the bandage off the wound that was busy, like, you know, separating underneath. Um, and, and that's that's interesting. That opens up all kinds of opportunities. Ken, then Judy, and then we're just, probably- Just a quick response there, Jerry. Go ahead, tearing, the, tearing the bandage off the wound is, is the vulnerability wound open to the air, but you've got to admit you were wounded. Secondly, the having the conversation and revealing the system to itself is part of what I just did to you guys, right? Because a complex adaptive reflexive system evolves if it sees itself in motion and it can evolve successfully if it sees itself in motion in systems context. If it's the wrong context or the wrong story, it doesn't matter what you do, you're fucked. That is a term of art that I agree with entirely. Um, Ken, then Judy, and then we're out of the call. So I wanted to offer um, a story from a friend of mine. Um, a few years ago, I took a, I, I was asked to teach a positive psychology course and I didn't really know much about positive psychology. So I had to read a stack of books on it before I could do that. And um, in the course of that, I discovered that when I did my signature strength test, that optimism was number 17 on my list, which is not where I wanted it to be. And I was told, do not attempt to work and raise something from lower up to higher. But I said, you know, although I'm generally upbeat, I have this vision out on a time horizon of dire circumstances that often colors my short-term thinking. And so I decided I would interview optimists, people who are optimists. And one of these is a, uh, uh, an African-American woman who has done diversity work for a long time in her career. And, you know, it has not Hand out. She says, she'll first tell you, you know, the diversity work I did in corporations failed. It really didn't change anybody's mind, didn't change anybody's policies. You know, it just wasn't working. And I said, you know, how do you stay optimistic in the face of all the failure, in, in the face of everything you faced? I know her personal story a lot, which I will not share here, but she's been through some shit. And I'm like, how do you stay optimistic? And she said, I steer through the rear view mirror. I said, what does that mean? And she said, well, 200 years ago, my ancestors were here on this, on this continent and they had no rights. They had nothing. You know, babies could rip from their mother's breast. Husbands and wives could be separated. Horrible, horrible things could happen. And there was no recourse. There was no one you could go to and say, this is an outrage because we were not treated as human. And then a war was fought and we got some rights. 
And then we had to face reconstruction and carpetbaggers and, and uh, Jim Crow and, and, and minstrelsy and all these things. And we, you know, redlining and, and after the war and then the civil rights came, we got some more rights. And now I'm, it's time again to rise up because black men are being killed, shot in the back as we're seeing on TV all the time. And when I look back at that and see what my ancestors survived and went through, I don't feel that it's within my right to, to give up or to feel overwhelmed because I have so much more than they did. So in the event that things do not go well over the next few days, do, I don't think it's within our, feel despair, feel, definitely don't, don't go in denial, feel it, but don't give up. There's, there's tough stuff in the human spirit and we need to access that to get through. Thank you, Ken. That's that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, Judy, you have a last word today. I'd just like to close with the thought that <clears throat> the system has been broken for a long time and it has been in continual decline. And some friends from Europe said, why are you surprised at the election? <laughs> this this isn't the election isn't going to change much. What's going to change is is things we do. And I think that was incredibly wise because the system is broken and pretty dysfunctional and it's gonna tug back and forth with very little positive movement. And even if the person I prefer is elected, I fear that will be the outcome because of other dimensions and the disruptive, the clearly planned and executed strategic disruption that's being engineered for an, an unimaginable long period of time. So I think we all need to reach right into ourselves and touch that heritage of our grandparents who had little and the connections that they made and the inner strength they had and just share that generously with each and every person we're in contact with. Because that's what's going to provide shared hope that allows us to then say, um, here's a hug. I'm sorry you're going through this. How can I help? And that generativity can cascade. So that's my insurrection. <laughs> um, why don't we hang out with your what you just what you all just said for another half minute and then I'll take us out of the call, but let's just go into silence for a little bit. Thank you all. Namaste. Good luck. Namaste. All right. Namaste, Namaste, everyone. I sent an invite Bye -bye. out for a call tomorrow morning at eight, and then we'll we'll have more calls. Thank you. Good to be connected with you all. Bye bye. Same here. Much love. Namaste, everyone.